welcome to Black Music, Let the Archives Sing. I'm your host and moderator, Angela Scribbling, and with me today is a distinguished panel of guests. Nat Adderley Jr. hails from an iconic jazz family who included his uncle, Cannonball Adderley, and his father, Nat Adderley. Nat is not only a pop and rhythm and blues music arranger and pianist, but he's best known for his work as music director for Luther Vandross. Wow. Jason Moran is a jazz pianist, composer, and educator who first debuted as a band leader in 1999 when he recorded with Greg Osby on the soundtrack to Human Motion. He has since released music solo with his trio, The Bandwagon, and with other bands. Damien Sneed is a pianist, organist, conductor, composer, producer, arranger, and educator whose work spans genres, jazz, classical, pop, and R&B. In 2009, Sneed established the label Le Chateau Earl Records, reflecting his varied musical interests and featuring critically acclaimed artists from an array of musical genres. Maimouna Youssef, AKA Moo Fresh, is a Grammy nominated singer, MC, songwriter, and acclaimed hip hop artist. She has co-written or written songs for Common and The Roots. She has performed with Bobby McFerrin, Layla Hathaway, Erica Badu, and Rhapsody. Terry Lynn Carrington, recently named NEA Jazz Master. Terry Lynn Carrington is an award-winning drummer, composer, producer, whose career began as a child prodigy. She has performed with legendary artists Dizzy Gillespie, Stan Getz, Clark Terry, Herbie Hancock, Wayne Shorter, Al Jarreau, and many others. Her 2013 Grammy Award for Best Jazz Instrumental Album established her as the first female musician to win the award. She serves as founder and artistic director of the Berkeley Institute of Jazz and Gender Justice, as she has served as the music director curator for this 20th anniversary celebration for the History Makers. Welcome. It is a pleasure to have you all here. You represent different genres of music and that is wonderful. We want our conversation to focus on black music history, its accurate representation in the American lexicon and its proper preservation. Now I'd like to begin our discussion with our growing up and who the value of music was in, in, or how I should say. All right, I would like to begin our discussion with uh, how you grew up and how the value of music was imparted to you by family members and your community. I'd like all the panelists to respond, but let's start with you, Nat Adderley. I am the worst one to start with. <laughs> I uh, I say all the time, you know, my dad was on the road all the time when I was young. I mean, up until I was around 10, they were, you know, they were on the road 10 months a year, something like that. So, uh, so when my dad got home, we cut the TV on, we were playing, not Family Feud, that's the new Password and, 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 and all the, all the game shows, we sit down at the card table, play Monopoly and, and we learned bid whist and all that. He was not really one to come home and put music on. He had been living with that for all that time. He came home to turn it off. So, uh, but I kind of got all of that on my own. So you see what I mean? I'm the worst one to start with. I do not feel like he was coming home showing me stuff, but I got it anyway. I got it just by being around. It's osmosis or something because I was without him at home. I was picking out tunes on the piano and and showing my interest by the time I was six or seven. So uh, that's what happened with me. I told you, start with someone else. <laughs> it's not good, it's real. All right, Jason, my man, how about you? How would you answer that? <laughs> I like that. <laughs> um, I mean, I would probably say that, I, that the value of music education was forced upon me by public schools in Houston, Texas, uh, where I grew up and that the public schools were the place where I learned music. And so it started as an elementary school student and was forced to play violin. Everyone was forced to play keyboard. Um, I mean, we think about the value of public education. And for me, that's 
really the value of it is to actually put it into people's hands who might least expect it. And it wasn't until like maybe I started that my parents were like, oh, we should get a piano at the house. And my brothers and I, we all had to take music lessons. It wasn't an option. I think for my parents, kind of like black middle class in Houston, they thought these kids, these boys need to learn what it means to practice something and what the value of that is. And for me, you know, also having a family that really, you know, I'm sure many of you also have this too, a family that when they came over the house, okay, Jason, so play something. <laughs> and that, you know, that's the best concert hall of all is playing for your family, uh, if they like it. <laughs> so that's how it started for me. I love it. I'm sure they liked it just fine. <laughs> and Damien. Well, for me, the importance and value of music uh, came out of going to church. Uh, that's all I remember and watching the choir. A lot of people don't know this, so this is probably my first time sharing this, but I used to have a lot of figurines like He-Man and stuff like that. So after church, I would come home and recreate the choir and the band. And I would like play with the figurines and like have them direct the choir and sing and things like that. So for me, uh, that was my first instance of hearing, uh, you know, music and seeing people perform. But really my father forced me to listen to jazz albums, classical albums, opera, blues. I mean, so many records that he had accumulated when he was in the army. So every Friday night, we were listening to about three hours of music and then he would quiz me on it. So that's really how I got my start right there in the home. He was like my music teacher, drop the needle. That's an old, old phrase, but yeah. <laughs> Thank you. All right. We're asking a question. How the value of music was imparted to you by a family member or your community? My Muna, how would you answer that question? Yeah, I definitely came from a, a family of uh, artists, musicians, just creatives in general. My mother's a singer. She's a, a, a jazz singer. Um, my grandmother's a singer. My uncles are singers. And um, I think my great grandmother was a singer too. My grandmother was a, a gospel choir director. So, like, I never grew up in church. My mother had converted to Islam by the time I was born because people always say, What church you grew up singing in? I said, I've never even been to church. But because my grandmother was a choir director, we had church at her house. <laughs> so, she would teach me all the old gospel songs and uh, hymns and escape songs from slavery. Uh, she would also teach me like Native American songs and my grandmother's Choctaw. So I would learn traditional songs um, used during ceremony. And um, my mom at home, she played a lot of African music like Leta Mbulu and Miriam Makeba and Huma uh, Sekela. So it just, it Fela Kuti. And um, I just had a very like wide range of musical understanding from all over the world from the time I was small. And it definitely influenced how I perceive, you know, how I understand music to be way more connected, you know, than like, you know, how the industry has a bunch of different genres and that never made sense to me because I understood music as a whole, you know, just as a spiritual experience. And that definitely came from growing up in my household. And my mom was very adamant about me understanding like my first performance on stage with her, I was four years old and I had like rehearsal time at home where I had to um, study harmony blending, you know, from the time I was like little like that, you know? So, and my, my siblings, they could go outside and play and I had to stay inside and rehearse, mm -hmm. you know? So she saw something in me and was like, nah, you gotta practice. You gotta <laughs> focus. <laughs> That's awesome. Thank God for that. And Terry Lynn, how would you answer that? Well, I came from a very musical family. Uh, my grandfather played drums and he was um, a local drummer in the Boston area and played with people like Duke Ellington and Fats Waller. He was roommates in college with uh, great Chewberry. And um, then my father also played drums and saxophone and he was friends with everybody. So I, I didn't go to church either. I didn't have music in public schools either. But I had, you know, Clark Terry and Rossan Roland Kirk, and also Nat's father, Nat Adderley, coming to our house when I was a kid. In fact, um, Nat Adderley gave me one of my first big gigs when I was 14, Southern for Jimmy Cobb with his group. So that was a huge um, experience, you know, for me that affected me for many, many years. So my situation was really different. And I have to give so many um, props to my dad for 
you know, taking a little girl into clubs when I was like seven, eight, nine, ten years mm-hmm. old, where some people were looking at him like he was crazy. Um, but, you know, he just, you know, believed I needed to be around the music. And uh, that, that really paid off for me. So That's awesome. I was going to ask who your musical role models and inspirations growing up. Uh, would you say that you just answered that question or is there anyone else you would add to that? Well, for me, um, role models, I mean, I have role models in various areas. And, and also, if I think about it good, not just in jazz, um, people outside of jazz, like um, Bernice Johnson Regan of Sweet Honey and the Rock and, and um, Angela Davis, uh, people like that that uh, have been influential in my life. Uh, but, you know, Max Roach and Elvin Jones and all of the, you know, great jazz master drummers were also extremely influential and I got to know all of them. Uh, Jack DeJanette became, you know, my biggest mentor and also uh, I would say Wayne Shorter next. Um, so, I mean, I didn't have any women role models, uh, for the most part, uh, that played instruments, but, um, okay. there was so many amazing musicians that, um, that, that mentored and this, you know, jazz music is, um, an apprentice art form. You know, you have to have those kinds of mentors. So mm-hmm. I was very fortunate like that. Very fortunate. And Matt, how would you answer that? Who are some of your musical role models growing up and how have they influenced your music? Right. Uh, I can answer that. Well, uh, I should say, you know, obviously uh, my dad and uncle uh, did, and I cannot explain to you how. I'm telling you, it's being around just osmosis in daily conversation. I was not sat down to... To, to learn something, it wasn't like that. In fact, I started out seriously classical. I, I was European uh, uh, as, as a young age. And then, but, but from there I was, you know, I love the Beatles and Motown uh, and, and Burt Backrack and Hal David first. I first started really, uh, I guess my first jazz real influence, I started imitating McCoy uh, at, a, at a young age. But then quickly I became uh, just a uh, Herbie and Chick became uh, my heroes uh, as a teenager when I was doing jazz, because really I was uh, going the other way. I was I was determined to uh, go a different way than my family. I was, I was spent my life, I'm still <laughs> kind of spending my life proving that this is all me. This is, I did it myself. I didn't have any help from the family. You know, we're all very strange. Uh, so, so, um, but anyway, and then, but the, the music in my house, I swear, my biggest memory is Aretha all day long, especially Aretha gospel. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Amazing grace. <laughs> that's my, yes. my biggest memory. <laughs> oh, that's so, uh, what, what can I say? So it was around, the music was around and, and I was in it, but, uh, just separately, and uh, my first little band was in eighth grade. It was a it was a Motown. <laughs> we were we were doing the Temptations. I still have pictures. So that's where I was at that age. I, I'm a I'm a latecomer to jazz. I always say so. It sounds strange and unbelievable, but I'm a latecomer to jazz. But yeah, I, I was I was I was running away. Is this a cycle? Is this a cycle? A psychology panel here? Okay. <laughs> I'm your doctor. <laughs> That's really wonderful. All of it that made you who you are and the music that you churn out, however you got there, we are here for it. So oh, thank I'd you. Appreciate that. <laughs> Absolutely. All of that. I hope it I hope all of that comes out in everything I do because it's all a part of me. Classical, jazz, and R and B and pop are all in there. I think it's evident in every piece of music I've ever put out, I think. That's beautiful. Um, Jason, how would you answer the question? Your musical role models or inspirations growing up and how it's influenced your music? I mean, you know, in our house, you know, uh, my parents aren't musicians, but they love the music so much. Um, So they always took us to see anybody who came to Houston in the 80s, you know, so whether it was Andre Watts or, you know, uh, Wynton Marsalis when his band was coming around. But I think the one that made the biggest impact is the combination of hearing Thelonious Monk as a 13 year old 
and also, you know, Chuck D from Public Enemy and the Native Tongues, which is a collective of, of groups, including Queen Latifah, uh, Moni Love, Tribe Called Quest, and De La Soul. And um, I mentioned those hip hop acts because there was something that I felt was, you know, uh, defining of my generation. And they were also sinking uh, knowledge into the music too. Um, they somehow would prepare you for the future trials you'd have to face uh, in music. And as a pianist, you know, not working with lyrics, it, it sometimes is a struggle uh, trying to decode what, say, James Reese Europe or Scott Joplin means from another century. And how does that resonate for 2020? And I think as a kid, hearing Chuck D even say the word Coltrane or hear Rakim from Eric B and Rakim talk about how he wanted to be Coltrane, you know, the Coltrane of MCs. To hear them reference that music while the, at the same moment that I'm trying to study it or sample it was so validating because it was, it's not a popular form of music to, to study like in the neighborhood. And somehow the lie gets told that our black music isn't black music too. That's also the lie that goes through the neighborhood, you know? So how do I kind of try to find something in Thelonious Monk, just not only as a name which seemed from another planet, you know, even though he's the third, <laughs> you know, his father was a Thelonious Monk too, you know? Um, so, but to hear a name like Thelonious Monk at the same time when I'm also, you know, going through puberty as a teenager, you know, looking for identity, but hearing like something so definitive and what that sound and what the piano, I had never heard anything like that. Mozart ain't sound like that. Beethoven doesn't sound like that. Ravel don't sound like that. That's North Carolina, you know, that's North Carolina mm -hmm. moving to New York City, defining the future of the instrument. And I needed that. I didn't understand everything he was saying as a teenager, but I knew that that was my heart, you know, and I also knew that the the, the way the activism that Chuck D embedded into Public Enemy as a group was something that I knew my generation also needed. And, you know, those two things, listening to them both at the same time, drove me uh, in kind of insane <laughs> and also free. They drove me free. <laughs> well, I love that so much. Damien, how about you? Your musical role models, inspirations, how it's influenced your music? Well, for me, I've been very uh, blessed and fortunate to not only have mentors, but to get to work with them. Uh, the first one I can remember is Jesse Norman. Uh, we both are from Augusta, Georgia. And before I was adopted, uh, she sang at my parents' wedding. Uh, I think she was a freshman at Howard University. That's why I ended up going to Howard University, trying to follow in her footsteps. At that time, she was larger than life. So if I was outside playing basketball or doing homework, my parents would stop, uh, call me and say, you've got to come. Uh, get into the living room as a family. We're going to watch Jesse Norman. So like having a chance to work with her was awesome. Then I met Winston Marsalis in eighth grade uh, there in Augusta, Georgia. And that changed my life uh, seeing someone who was not in the box. I, I remember in the uh, late eighties, he got classical artist of the year at the Grammy awards and jazz artist of the and year. Jazz. Yes. So that let me know you do not have to be in a box. Uh, and then meeting him and getting, being able to work with him uh, a lot later on, in my life, I uh, was I'm very fortunate to uh, have that opportunity. But then I have to mention these other two people. Um, another mentor of mine when I got to Howard University was Richard Smallwood. I actually heard him playing on the radio my last week in Augusta. And my friend from the NAACP Axel competition called me when my parents and I arrived in DC at the Holiday Inn Hotel. Uh, and he said, hey, I'm gonna pick you up with my mother to go to a concert. I'm like, what concert? He's like, get in the car. When I got in the car, his mom and and my friend took me to this church, and it was Richard Smallwood's CD release for his song, Total Praise, that everybody knows. It's like a well-known hymn now. And then since then, I've been able to work with Richard. And the last person that uh, Nat also mentioned is the late Aretha Franklin. Uh, my father used to drive me to funeral homes and say, I'm going to make you go inside and play the way Aretha's father made her play, because we saw on a Donahue interview, Donahue, dating myself again, that you know she got her start playing in funeral homes. So it's funny, my father, you know, has already passed. He didn't know that I would have a chance to meet her and work with her. But seeing an artist who uh, has had longevity and could do any style with uh, integrity and knew the business and the career, it was really awesome. 
uh, because all these great people that we're mentioning, uh, they all really had their own sound and their own originality. And that's, I think, why I was drawn to these particular people as mentors, because they didn't, they weren't cookie cutters. They weren't, you know, a copy or a facsimile. They were very individual and unique. All right. I love this. And I, oh my goodness, I love all the answers here. Maimuna, mm -hmm. how would you answer that? Talk about your musical role models or inspirations growing up and how they influenced your music. Yeah, my mom's probably my biggest one. Uh, I was homeschooled, so I spent a lot of time at home with my mother. <laughs> um, Lauren Hill was a big influence for me growing up. Um, my father really, he's the one that introduced me to hip hop. Like his the, his two favorite artists are Billie Holiday and Tupac, right? So he, mm. he introduced me to hip hop and um, and a lot of very political music, you know, cause my mom wouldn't let any, any music that played in the house, like she didn't mind rap music. She likes rap music as long as it's conscious and political. So we could listen to the conscious songs that Tupac did, <laughs> that he made. Um, and a lot of Public Enemy and um, Karis One and Sister Soldier. And then my brother got me into um, Wu-Tang Clan, which my mother allowed me to use as a class material. So I would like, you know, decode and decipher all of the RZA's lyrics. And I would um, write down his raps and circle any words I didn't know the definition to. And then I would research the definition and I would write the definition in the word three times, use it in a, in a sentence, you know? And so that became, um, yeah, they just were a part of my, my education, you know, course material and common as well. You know, I used to write out the lyrics to, I used to love her. That was a part of an example of personification for my literature class. Um, yeah, so a lot of like, you know, like you said too, a lot of my heroes, people I grew up listening to ended up being people that I worked with, you know, when I became an adult. So they were big influence. Outkast was a really big influence on me. That was the first time I realized that um, between Outkast and um, Dead Prez, that you could rap about absolutely anything you wanted to. I think before then, I thought that songs had to be about specific types of things. And, you know, they really bent all the rules and recreated the rules about what you could talk about in a song, even like stream of consciousness writing. Like it doesn't just have to be, you know, your kind of traditional, like the way Motown might structure a song, right? Your theme, your chorus, your verse, your bridge, tie back in. Like Outcast, Outcast was the first time I, I, I heard stream of consciousness writing and writing that was like really real and visceral and raw and honest. And I knew that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to tell stories that didn't have to be cleaned up for public consumption. You know, like they could stay as raw and as real as you experience them in the moment. Um, so yeah, they, they shaped a lot of my childhood and a lot of uh, my artistry, how I would grow to create music. Uh, Nina Simone was also a big part of that. My mom listened to a lot of Nina Simone and I was always so captivated by her tone um, by her piano playing, just the way she could convey a story and hold people captive. Like you couldn't move when she was singing. And I remember thinking like, I want to do that. <laughs> you know, like I want to have that kind of impact and influence on an audience. Um, so yeah, amongst many, they were ones that were like really influential. That's a beautiful take. Nina Simone still has that impact on me. Oh. <laughs> whenever I hear her music. Thank you. Nat, can you speak to the history of your father's musical career and your relationship with him and how that influenced your music and your career, if you will? The first part, my father and uncle's musical career. Is that was the beginning of your question? Yes, uh, uh, if, yes if you could speak to wow. the history of your fa yeah. father's musical career your okay. relationship with him i'm gonna go back let me see your um you know my father started as a singer i hear uh, uh around tallahassee uh at very young as a 15 year old and he's short anyway so he must have looked like he was eight and uh so he was around the clubs in tallahassee uh and uh you know of course uh, they they both went to the army <clears throat> And uh, really started the the the, the crux of their, their play, playing playing uh, uh, in the army. Then Cannonball came out and went to Dillard 
uh, high school in, in Fort Lauderdale, taught there for a while. Uh, my dad was still in the service, I guess, but you know, Cannonball came to New York first and uh, was this, got called up from and quit his job at uh, Dillard High School uh, after that. My father fo followed him. And um, and then by then, uh, I guess uh, we, we're, uh, I, I'm born, I moved to New York at one. And like I told you, they were gone just all the time. It really is, uh, it, it, this is honest. I don't, he was not around. I wanted him to leave again when I was a young, kid my dad coming home was was an intrusion it's like what are you doing here we're good <laughs> me and mom are, are great who are you kind of you know but um and then as the years went on he uh was, was home more often but then uh gosh I'm, I'm jumping way ahead you know my my experiences with them uh as a kid, they really did define me in a weird way. Uh, I did write a song when I was 11 that Cannonball came and heard and recorded. Wow. It's called I'm On My Way. <laughs> I'm, uh, I, I, I walk into, Christian is so crazy. I walked into Dizzy's and, and uh, Christian uh, McBride was on stage. He saw me walk in and sit in the front and he starts playing I'm On My Way. That dude knows every, I mean, he remembers everything, every piece of music that he's ever heard. He's so weird, <laughs> Christian is. But he started playing my tune when I was wrote when I was eleven. So, uh, but anyway, that happened. So then I, I really forgot about that. Then at fifteen, Terry, I saw you on uh, on the Jazz House Kids thing. I was there trying to trying to spark in, trying to figure out how to comment because I saw you uh -huh. mention the price you got to pay to be free. That's right. Uh, like, and you were mentioning that from Les McCann, uh, cover covering that, uh, right. and uh, so anyway, that happened at uh, when I was uh, fifteen. But then I went back to high school and forgot all about that. My sister just found a record. We in high school, I did join a band. Thank God, I went to music and art high school in in New York, which uh, Cannonball's wife, uh, Alga was the one who really, I mean, she came in the family and kind of kind of determined my musical uh, uh, education. She was the one that said I needed to go to Juilliard prep division uh, when I was uh, 10 or 11. Then I stayed with the Manhattan School of Music. When Juilliard, when the building of Juilliard became the Manhattan School of Music, I stayed with the building as opposed to move downtown with Juilliard. But she did that. And then the music and art, I, I just can't not imagine my life had I not gone to music and art and met all those musicians. I guess if I was in Houston, it would have been similar at HSPBA. I might have met my first wife there if I'd gone there. Uh, anyway, because uh, I did in college. My, my first wife went to HSPBA. That's how I got there. And we went there to have the first baby. But anyway. Um, so in high school, I met all the people, Buddy Williams, the drummer, and uh, Earl McIntyre, uh, and uh, Francisco Centeno. We were all in high school together. I think Noel Pointer played with us on occasion, um, and uh, but we had a band even. And my sister just found this record. We had a band called Natural Essence, and we did a record. I'm almost embarrassed when I listen to that record, and, I, and I'm like, goodness, if I was doing this as a senior in high school, what happened? <laughs> you know, I just, I really kind of went to college from there and just got into calculus <laughs> and and thinking I wanted to be a lawyer. Uh, wow. I thought it was very strange. But anyway, uh, yes, yeah, so I was playing around with, with all of that, but, uh, but so my father and uncle obviously were involved and and helpful sending me, but no, we did not sit around having conversations. Um, I heard what I heard. I don't remember them pointing me to any of my piano uh, heroes as a child. I think that I, I don't remember them doing that. I certainly found it. I began to love McCoy, and then I, as I said, I began to love Herbie and Chick. Uh, and 
that's uh, that's what happened. So they were there influencing, guiding, but I cannot tell you about it because I think I think they sensed that I was running away. You know, as a kid, they was so interested in making sure I did not feel forced into mm-hmm. the family business that it was forever. It was like three years before they got me a piano. Everybody was saying, get the boy a piano. He likes it, but they didn't want to force me. They didn't want me to feel forced. So I waited forever for my first piano even. So um, I, did I answer the question at all? I mean, it was it was just a... Uh, it was just different, and it's hard to explain, and um, you just had to be there. <laughs> and, my, and the rest of my family was not musicians. You understand? My mother was not a musician at all. My sister is not a musician at all. So when they weren't home, it was about me going to my piano lessons. Okay. That was my musical life. It was not in school. You know, I did not have a, a bunch of uh, motivation from music class in school. I never that never would have happened that way, as I heard. Uh, I guess a couple of you say I did not have that until music and art. I mean, we had music, we had the chorus, but it was not and nothing else, just just choir. So um, no, I, I love how much more education is in the schools now. I talk about it all the time. My gosh, what the kids have today. If if I had had even that kind of a, I mean that option if I, that was even in my world to go to a jazz class, oh yeah, and learn that kind of harmony and that and that swing you know as a kid I mean that it was you know that that was non-existence uh, oh. when I was a kid. Well, I'm very ago. happy that you found your way and you know in many ways as you've said and described. A lot of it was, uh, you know, you just found your way. It was in your DNA, perhaps, to go this route. I think so. And just hanging out. And like I said, music and art. (laughs) Yeah, I love it. And uh, Terry Lynn, can you talk about your upbringing and studying music at such a young age and maybe how all of that contributed to your musical trajectory? Um, Yeah. I uh, got a scholarship to Berkeley when I was 11. Um, I sat in with Oscar Peterson. And um, it was interesting because he had just finished playing. And I just remembered this part recently, actually my parents reminded me that I was sitting next to Ella Fitzgerald watching him play because she was on the bill as well. And she grabbed me, when he finished playing, she grabbed me by the wrist, took me to Oscar and said, she played with Clark Terry last night. You really need to hear her. And then he had me, they were packing up Keter Betts on the bass and um, Butch Miles was playing drums. And uh, he said, wait, let me, you know, let me hear this. And the president um, of Berkeley was there. So that's how I got my scholarship. So a lot of stars, you know, aligned in that way for me. And I went once a week um, from 11 until I went full time when I was 17. Um, And I met, you know, so many people that went through Berkeley. I don't don't even go into the list of people, but just a lot of musicians. And um, then I moved to New York when I was 18. Uh, So my studying wasn't terribly formal um, in that way. I mean, I I went and took classes at Berkeley, but I didn't, I only went three semesters full time. But I do want to comment on what Nat was just saying about um, education. And as great as it is now, you know, I really feel like um, it's also created a problem, jazz education, because the people that have access to it mostly these days are not black. And they've set up a, a curriculum that uh, doesn't value some of the things that are most important in jazz. Um, I never hear anybody talking about the blues anymore. You know, <laughs> and it, it's become, um, you know, all about, you know, technique. And, uh, you know, I heard somebody say, you know, that Michael Berker is the cleaned up Coltrane or, I mean, I've heard all kinds of um, things that really point to the fact that um, jazz education has failed the black community, basically. Um, Mm -hmm. And I do a program, a summer program at Berkeley and um, it's merit-based, you know, you audition to get in and, you know, there's so many young uh, kids that come from privileged backgrounds that uh, have, you know, they're in all the programs when they're young and, and they're given all the big bands, the Grammy band or the Monterey Next Gen band. And, um, 
they're kind of in this pipeline to get to uh, these schools. And so for me, um, I think we need to really rethink jazz education um, and, mm -hmm. and basically decolonize it. Um, mm. And that's, I just wanted to comment on that because it's something I've been thinking about a lot as somebody that's involved in, in jazz education mm -hmm. at a prestigious, uh, I guess it's prestigious to some people, um, institute. Uh, and I'm sure, I'm sure Jason and Damien probably have something to say about that too as, uh, as educators. Well, I would like to just throw in there from Berkeley. I mean, being in New York, I've been saying for, for a while now that when I meet somebody from Berkeley, as far as being trained and we, I mean, I, I, I love them all. I, I've been telling everybody when they come in and they say uh, they went to Berkeley, I'm in. I mean, I have not been failed yet, you know, from the students. Now, I don't know everybody, and and I am understanding totally of what you're saying, Terry, but but, but I'm saying that uh, the musicians that I meet, uh, when they get to Manhattan and they just come up on the gig with me and like say, I went to Berkeley, every time it's like, oh, they're going to be able to play. They're going to be able to hear me. I mean, they're going to be able to function in this in this thing. So I, I've... Uh, I put Berkeley up there uh, for the last while. I mean, more than anywhere, really. I mean, I don't meet a bunch of kids from anywhere else. I kind of do. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, Oberlin or whatever. No, Berkeley is Berkeley is it to me. But I hear what you're saying, and um, and uh, certainly, I mean, I I could talk. I don't want to. I don't want to talk about the uh, difference in the playing styles and understanding and soul and swing and stuff in the you know what I mean? I want to I want to stop there, but there certainly is a difference. I mean, you can learn a whole lot and play all the notes and have all that understanding. And I can be sitting there and it's like, you know what? I don't care. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, I, I don't care about all of that. <laughs> You're not bringing me anything from your heart and spirit and and all that, you know, so. So I do, I do get that, but they'll, but uh, anybody, they'll come and play that part though, and and play a good solo and play some good notes. <laughs> you know, Allison, I'm sorry. Good notes, that's funny. I mean, but I also think, you know, the, yeah. the other part is, you know, I mean, look, like some students would give every part of their education to grow up in a family that was an Adderley family, right? That that legacy. Um, but also, most importantly, I think what Terry's talking about is, is the elimination of the Black narrative in teaching yeah. Black music. So, and it's centuries of Black narrative, right? And it ain't just confined to America either. And, um, and, and it's distressing as a teacher sometimes to not only work in America, but work around the world and really have to pick apart the, the locks that are on these chains that bind down the music. Uh, but then, then bind down the understanding that these students should have about why black music is powerful, why black music is powerful, why it affects the people it affects who are not from the same background. Yet, well, why won't you read a black novel? <laughs> why won't you know black poetry? You know, why won't? You, why will you not have the kind of investigation that you look for the intricacy of a Coltrane solo to know that there were black composers eliminated from the canon systematically, you know? Um, and that part is distressing. So, and to not know, to have students be afraid to even say the word black, you know, to have students be afraid to, to confront their own kind of privilege uh, within taking the freedom that other musicians did not have as an opportunity, but as a function of just being able to sort through what oppressive American state has to offer for musicians looking for freedom in the space that they share on the stage. And, uh, and that shows up for a couple of hours. For those bands back in the 50s and 60s, it showed up for six hours. They could have that moment from 9 a.m., 9 p.m. to 3 a.m., where they hit the set hard, right? That's why that music sounds to a degree so much better. <laughs> it's because they spent the time on the stage, you know? That, but that's a freedom place. I always think of the stage as a portal. But in general conservatory education, black stages, they, don't, they won't talk about the church, the importance of that, the church, not only as a spiritual place, but as a political place for black people to meet. Uh, they won't talk about what the blues is. They won't talk about those escape songs that Mumu just talked about. They won't think that, 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 there's, that there's a, 
that when we use a phrase like to run, or then we use a phrase like walk, <laughs> mm-hmm. like black people music is about transportation. <laughs> <laughs> it's about departure. <laughs> and when we get to the place where George Clinton and James Brown are talking about the one, then it's the demand. But those things happen at the same time that society is demanding that too. So that kind of like, that breadth of knowledge in conservatory education for mostly white men is lacking. And it really demands, you know, what Terry has started at Berkeley is powerful because it really also brings in the social activism that needs to be in line with how we also learn the music too, that they are not separated because we don't live that kind of life as, as, as artists. That's right. And you know, we're right. already working on this. And Jason, if I can ask you how, or can we discuss the history of the genres that you represent? And if you can talk about the pivotal moments in the history of African-Americans in jazz. I mean, I, you know, I, I think about the power of black literacy um, and how dangerous that is for us to show. (laughs) And I mean like for centuries when you're not allowed to show that you can pick up a book and decipher what you read um, to then the moment when Scott Joplin writes down a song in the late 1800s, how powerful a moment that is for our future. Um, And then hearing like, let's say uh, Louis Armstrong in 1930 play incredibly intricate music where nobody has music on the stand. <laughs> and mm. I think about these as pow- not only powerful moments sonically, but I think about them powerful moments at- visually too. Um, yeah. Because there's, a, there's a, a kind of a leap that the artist is trying to take. There's a leap that Mary Lou Williams takes as the architect of bebop. There's a leap she sees and hears and they're plants into to bebop, right? That all these other musicians from Monk to Bud Powell then sow those plants into the ground and make a new, uh, a new species. So every decade, black music continues to evolve, you know? I mean, we're in 2020 and we've watched the music change in the past 10 years. Some good, some we'll see what happens with its future. I think for me growing up in the eighties at the kind of like the, as hip hop is being birthed and watching it continue to pull its relationship to not only black power, but the music around black power, um, that mm-hmm. part and making sure that they, that contains and stays with the music as it charts its next hundred years, I think is incredibly important. Uh, and all of the people that we mentioned are, are, are beyond canon. Um, and it's to think of musicians as artists in a way that, that goes beyond the canon that we have been prescribed to think that we function within. Uh, mm-hmm. Each one of us on this panel I know the breadth of the music is like is staggering, the the amount of things that we listen to and the amount of things we process and fuse together, and so that's also our strong point, and that can't be coded and and sold as an app Apple. <laughs> exactly, exactly, and you know to that point, let's talk about classical music. Damien, what moments or periods in history of African Americans in classical music resonate with you the most? And also, if I can add to that, what are some of the most significant periods for African-Americans in the history? So when I think about uh, classical music and the African-American contribution to classical music, which is viewed mainly as being a European tradition, uh, and I think about my uh, the trajectory of my career, one thing that comes to mind is my undergraduate study at, uh, at HBCU Howard University, historically black college and university. Why? Because my piano teacher, my professor, Raymond Jackson, was one of the first African-American uh, pianist, male pianist, to go to Juilliard and write his dissertation on the music of Black composers. That was the politically correct term at that time. Then also, uh, right down the hall, I would run into Grady Tate, you know, who was doing music on uh, Sesame Street, and Keeter Betts. They were all there on the same floor that Donny Hathaway was a student there, Twinkie Clark, you know, all these great people. Uh, and then... I would play for the vocal uh, cl- courses of Matawilda Dobbs, who was one of the first African-American uh, singers, soprano, to sing at the Metropolitan Opera and have a contract. Then right down the hall was the great Sylvia Olden Lee, who went to Oberlin uh, Conservatory. And Sylvia Olden Lee was one of the first African-Americans to be a vocal coach hired at the Metropolitan Opera. Her mother uh, was given a contract as a passer 
that's something we don't talk about often because of her complexion she would mm. be able to sing opera on the operatic stage but she couldn't say that she was black you know that was something that happened a lot and then also her father was one of the original uh fisk jubilee singers so going to howard university and having these people pass down this oral heritage and then also you know classes like blacks in the arts it, it was very interesting but i want to say this um, thinking about my career in classical music and everything, life really pushed me. I want to share this and uh, piggyback on what uh, Jason Moran just said. So I was very excited. You know, life happened, moved to New York City, went to Manhattan School of Music on a scholarship. Uh, but then as soon as I got my scholarship letter, my father called me and said that he had stage four cancer. And he died about two or three weeks later. I still went to school. Uh, as a student, but my first semester, I found out what my father had been keeping from me, that my mother had advanced, advanced dementia. So that was an issue because I said, okay, do I stay in New York and pursue my career and pay like four or $5,000 a month for a caretaker? Or do I drop everything and go back to Augusta, Georgia? So that was life that pushed me. And so I actually dropped out of school and I started working. And then from there, I did my first recording uh, called Introspections Live. Uh, Wycliffe Gordon, who's like a big brother to me, pushed me to do that, which was multiple genres. After that, I got a chance to work with Wynton uh, Marsalis with his Abyssinian mask and do a television show at BT. But people thought I was crazy because they said, why didn't you stay in school? So when you think about uh, the tradition even of classical music and uh, any, any style of music here in America that you're supposed to be a student and you have to stay in the conservatory or stay in the school, you know, it was very interesting for a full circle moment now that I'm back at MSM as a faculty member teaching the first African-American music history course, what's interesting is that the course presently is something new, but it's not seen as an equal to other history courses. And how is it that we are in America where so many indigenous musical styles have been created and fostered and nurtured by people of color, but yet our history is not important. So when we get to some sections about classical music and when my students graduate students and undergraduate students find the contributions of African-Americans in classical music, their mind is blown. I, I remember one student and the student wasn't trying to be negative. This is what the student was taught for several years in uh, the conservatory and in you know higher uh, education institutions. He said, well, you know, certain music by African-Americans should not be played at Carnegie Hall. And I said, well, what do you mean by that? He said, well, you know, music by African-Americans is for the club or it's for the church, or it's for a party, or it's for an outdoor event. And I immediately started playing videos and recordings of, of things that African-Americans have contributed, not just to Carnegie Hall as performers in classical, but period. And so now their viewpoint is different, but what I realized that people don't know this information. You know, it's because of uh, uh, platforms like this, the history makers, that people are able to be educated about the contributions of people of color in all styles and all genres of music, and even in particularly classical music. And so it's important that we have these conversations because some people don't know. And some people that look just like us don't know because it's not, it hasn't been passed down to their generation as well. Damien, you are so right. Thank you so much for saying that. And I don't get the impression it was malicious. It was just ignorance, you know. It was ignorance. Right. And, and that's what I love about education is that people are always open to change and open to something different. But, you know, I, it really uh, is important that colleges, universities, conservatories really open a space to uh, let their students know more about black people, BIPOC, black indigenous people of color, African American people, because there's so much that our people contributed that is not codified and written in textbooks as and published the way other, you know, things are. So, so true. I'm so happy we're having this conversation. My Mona, Mumu, Mumu Fresh, I want to ask you if you could share some of your favorite historical moments from the history of hip hop that resonate with you and your work. Could, could I also just speak on what we were just talking about? <laughs> oh, absolutely. Yeah, please do. Uh -huh. um, so, even when I teach young artists how to rap, and I teach them how to sing. I teach them about independent music business. Um, and I also teach them the history of protest music in America. But what I find with a lot of younger artists, you know, 12, 13, 14, is that they don't have good timing. And 
So I will have them listen to Sarah Vaughn for timing, even for hip hop. Because to me, that's how I learned timing. Like, that's how I learned to sit in a groove is by listening to Sarah Vaughn, how she, to me, how she wrote a beat. That's how I feel like she riding a beat, you know? And they'll either be a, before the tempo, or they'll be right on the tempo, and they don't have a sense of like spatial relationship. Like, I'll ask them like, when you close your eyes, where are you in the music? And they'll say, what do you mean by that? You know? <laughs> and I say, I can't, we can't even talk about rap music until you find yourself in the music, until you understand the relationship between you and and the and the bass and the hi hat and the snare and you know the guitar lick like until you find yourself in there and you are a piece of that instrument you'll never be a good rapper because you are a percussive instrument you know who has who is also communicating you know lyrical ideas um, and I, like I don't I don't think I even looked at it like that until I started teaching because I was trying to explain to them what I do. And it really is having that jazz background, listening to Eddie Jefferson and Thelonious Monk and all of these artists that my mom was playing, and I would mimic them scatting, and then I just turned those scats into rap. And then, you know, to, so I think the issue is they don't understand their history. They don't have any context for how they ended up here in 2020. They don't know the historical lineage that they're connected to. Every new genre that's created should be it's, it's, it's built on the backs or the shoulders of the genre before it so you should learn the genre before it and use that as uh fuel as you know as a, a basis to grow from but if you don't have knowledge of that background you really do yourself a disservice it's like you're starting over from scratch every time and you're not as good each time because you don't know where you came from and you're not pulling from the, the wealth the resource that we have and I like when I was in high school, I went to a performing arts school and auditioned for music and I got in and we were um, singing classical and they, my teacher told me I sing too black. And if I want to respect the music that I'm singing, you know, the Italians, they don't have this wide palette. And so in order to respect their traditions, you have to change my vocal palette and I have to learn to sing more like them. And I can understand respecting the tradition because I've been raised in multicultural traditions. So I get that, right? You go to another country, I'm gonna eat the food that they eat. I'm gonna sit with them, eat like them, move like them and to respect their tradition. So I respected the Italian and the Latin tradition. I learned to, to sing in all these different European languages and I did great, right? Straight A's. But now when we start, talking about Negro spirituals and we sing and nobody knows the, the, the trouble I've seen but Jesus and you want me to still sing with this vocal palette as if I've had a good life <laughs> and not as if I've been picking cotton and tobacco and sugar cane well no because now you're not respecting my people you're not respecting the historical lineage the, the experience that created this sound you want to mute this experience and, and whitewash it, clean it up, and make it seem like it was something that it wasn't, and I can't be a part of that. And I'm like 14 years old, and they kicked me out of the department. Mm -hmm. so, whatever. <laughs> well, for you for speaking up and, you know, really telling it like it is, and that was going into my, my next question. We just have a couple more minutes on okay. these questions before we go to the panel. But Matt, if I could ask you, um, so what, regrettably, has been lost in terms of African-American contributions to the field of music. And I'll start with you, Nat. Oh my goodness. Uh, you should start, I mean, lost, lost to me as well. I mean, there's, you know, I, I should um, use, use this moment. I mean, because they're by lost, I have a bunch of, recordings, a bunch of LPs got uh, willed by an uncle in from Boston, uh, my Uncle Jimmy. <laughs> but anyway, a whole room full. And I feel like I have, you know who I'm talking about, Terry? My oh, that's, my, that's my uncle too. That's your uncle too? Wow. <laughs> yes, well, Uncle Jimmy, of course. That. Okay, that's yeah. how I met your dad. Yeah. Oh. Wow, wow, okay. Well, I have all the jazz records and I've been, going through and um and i'm trying to pull out stuff and and, and i'm trying to purge stuff and maybe get it to be a, a a library bring it all collected from everywhere and uh 
you know, because right now it's, in, it's, it's scattered around a little bit, but I'm trying to maybe put it all together and get a library. But but in in going through all the old old stuff, I, I, I'll come across something that I've never heard of. And uh, so I'll call uh, somebody and, and uh, find out. And, and it really is something important. And I start feeling, I mean, I've done this over and over again. So so I'm realizing that there's a wealth of of, uh, of important stuff that informed the music in the 50s and 60s that uh, that we are absolutely unaware of. I mean, I just put it on and and it opens up. I mean, it reminded me of the, uh, I guess, of the first, well, well, Scott Joplin first, but then, um, I mean, it reminded me of the first uh, Bud Powell. When I first put on Bud Powell, it just was an immediate kind of discovery. Oh! That's what happened to to lead to this. It just became clear. So um and and, and it's true. It is not being uh, taught. I mean, I discovered that then. I should have known that. I should have understood that before I put on Bud Powell. I was an adult. I'd been to school and college and everything. So um, uh, study looking at jazz piano. So uh, so what has been lost? I think someone else will know specifically because they studied, you know, the specific things. All I can say is that there's a ton. And um, and I'm hoping I'm gonna be able to uh, soon kind of kind of contribute to that. I, I have a sub, I mean, maybe you guys will be able to call me and ask me if I can find something. I'm organizing it and alphabetizing and you'll be able to call me and find out that I have something and it'll be uh, usable you know, for you guys that are teaching right now. <laughs> you That's, know, so, uh, That's awesome. And Jason, how would you answer that same question? Well, to pick up on what uh, Nat just said, I think the, the Black Archive in general, and I mean from the, the one that exists in everybody's home currently right now, and the one that's at the Schomburg, you know, um, and that we need many of these because the country is so wide and because the geography tells a different story about how our people manifest themselves through sound. And that story is not the same in St. Louis as it is in Chicago. <clears throat> it's not the same in Los Angeles as it is in Miami. And but we need multiple archives and people like that Nad just mentioned this Uncle Jimmy, you know, there's how many millions of Uncle Jimmy's across the country, you yeah. know, who have decided to dedicate their home to keeping a bit of a story together, whether it's the old magazines, the old Ebony magazines that some of y'all parents had <laughs> stacked up somewhere, right? Or, you know, like whatever it is, is it the old Word Up magazines or old Vibe magazines? Like, what is it? What is it about the archive that tells parts of the story of the power of black music? And let's say I watched a panel, of, uh, a History Makers panel a few days ago with the artists, Delma Golden and Sandra Jackson Dumont and Theaster Gates, et cetera. And Theaster talked about, you know, the Jesse Owens DJ library, you know, that Jesse Owens was a, was a, was a DJ, you know, and that he had a record collection, or that Frankie Knuckles collection now lives in Chicago in his space. So we think about these places and how much music there is in Detroit, what that, what that, what that techno and house music has to offer. Where is that archive, you know? I keep thinking about now, currently, for the musicians that I grew up with, well, where is the Tribe Called Quest archive? <laughs> like, I'm concerned, you know, about where Ali Shaheed Muhammad keeps his, you know, all that material. Um, because some of it should end up at the museum in D.C., you know? But also, it really still relies on communities taking ownership uh, and taking space, and this needs space, you know, space in the community to acknowledge the power of the sound that we've made for centuries in this country and that we plan on making for the next next few centuries. So we still need space to, to just bring everything to a room, whatever these record collections, whatever these, these, these articles, these books, the way Toni Morrison writes about the music over and over and over again, that that's also part of the music archives, not simply a part of the literary archive. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's what I, I, I yearn for that moment when uh, those ideas come together to live in spaces across the country that we could all visit. I love it. And Damien, how would you answer that? Yes, I'd lo love to answer that because right now that discussion is being uh, uh, like 
shoveled, literally, because people will start to talk about diversity, uh, equity, and inclusion, particularly for classical music and classical music by Black composers or African American composers. And the reason I say it's shoveled is because uh, I see where a lot of well known Black composers, when they pass, uh, there's no estate set up. Their family members may not understand the value of their sheet music. And the stuff gets buried, it gets chipped away, it gets burnt, it gets, you know, uh, you know, just thrown away or they use it to, I don't know, decorate a book or something. But basically, how can classical music continue when a lot of classical music is uh, propagated by the university, by the college, by students performing for recitals and for juries and in class? But, you know, they say, well, the only music we have by Black composers is Porgy and Bess and... Uh, Scott Joplin, you know, particularly for opera, Porgy and Bess is written by George Gershwin. And a lot of people think because it incorporates, you know, Summertime and Black People in Catfish Row, that it's something by a Black composer. It's not. But when you go to these colleges and universities and conservatories, if you go to the library, you don't find music by Black composers because it hasn't been published. A lot of it was published, but for some reason, these publishing companies, I try to call them all the time, they've just disappeared. They kept the music. Nobody knows where it is. And a lot of this stuff is at HBCUs around the country. So one thing I want to do after COVID is over is try to go to like University of the South and Dillard University and a lot of these uh, HBCUs and try to go to the library and find out how we can make sure that the legacy, even particularly for classical composers that are black, that it's not lost. And so this music can be sent around the world so that students can begin singing it and they can hear it. Because once they sing it, they'll understand the performance practice and it will become a normal part of the canon and not just something that we only have a few spirituals by Harry T. Burley and Hall Johnson, you know, and this like, the, black people composed more than just spirituals. Yes. You know, uh, even people didn't know that Harry Burley uh, wrote art songs, you know? So it's, there's a lot that people have not discovered that if, uh, back like the Harlem Renaissance during that time, that people when, when you know, you had Langston Hughes and Zero No Hurston and, and all these people coming together in County Cullen, you know, with this, uh, this black nexus of just creativity, a lot of that has been lost because it's sitting on shelves, just like Jason was saying, or somewhere people don't know what it is. Thank you to all of our panelists for their thoughtful and thought-provoking responses. I'd like now to open up the discussion to the Music Makers Advisory Committee, who include two of our panelists, Nat Adderley Jr. and Terry Lynn Carrington, Professor of Music Theory and African American Music at Emory University, Dwight Andrews, Entertainment Lawyer, Music Executive, and Talent Management Chief Executive, Larkin Arnold Jr. Executive Director at Heroes and Legends, Janie Bradford, Singer and Songwriter for Kindred the Family Soul, Fatin Danzler, Distinguished University Emeritus Professor of Voice at the University of Michigan, George Shirley. Our first question is from Dwight Andrew. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you so much for this uh, really fantastic uh, com conversation. I had a comment and a question. Uh, I'll go with the comment first. It seems to me that uh, the very things that you all have been talking about, this distinguished panel, really gives me a narrative that I rarely hear. I may know your music, but I don't get a chance to hear you talking about education and some of these institutional issues and archival issues. And I'm wondering um, if there is a way that we might be able to continue this conversation so that we can know more about what you think more than just the sound of what you do. Uh, some of the things, uh, Terry Lynn, you and Jason, all of you have said, Nat, uh, Brother Snee, uh, Mumu, you talk about education and some of the deficiencies, and we don't hear that in the conversations about uh, music education. And so you all are on the forefront. I'd just like to see this conversation get expanded and to learn how we can broaden that portal of just hearing your voice. What are you thinking? You're on the front lines. That's my comment. Now I want to ask my question. This is an amazing group of musicians, thinkers, and influencers. And in some ways, uh, you are perfect uh, 
a perfect mirror to this idea of music. You represent all of these different styles, classical, blues, hip hop, jazz, you name it. Given all of the diversity that you all literally represent, my question is, well, what is black music? <laughs> so I wanted, the to put the hand, I wanted to put the hand grenade on the table because I <laughs> want to know how do I, how do I put all of these things together, the gospels, the spirituals, the classical, all of that. How do we um, try to share our understanding or what is your understanding of how the black fits into all of that? Oh, I, I think it's just about our, our experience. I think that is a sound that is born out of the black experience and the black experience is colored by white supremacy and, and about the way that we came to America during the transatlantic slave trade or for those who were already here. A lot of our cultures that we brought here and the cultures that were already here with indigenous people because um, if you listen to Seminole music, that is a mixture of, of enslaved Africans and the Muscogee tribes, you'll hear the blues, the, the temp and tempo, the timing, the, uh, the growl, the tone, the texture, like it's the blues, you know? And I think it's, it is a, it's a mixture of the cultural practice, the belief system, the, the spiritual center, you know, there, there is something to a spiritual tone, you know, there are for artists who, I don't even want to say artists, but like when my mother first taught me to sing, it wasn't about being on stage. It was about healing. She taught me how to ch channel spirit, God, through a certain tone in your voice. You know, and that's, I mean, if you study like new age, spiritual, uh, what do you call them? Um, sound therapists, they talk about tuning forks, about certain frequencies that tap into God, right? My mother was teaching me how to do that as a kid. My grandmother was teaching, they called it laying on of hands. They didn't call it Reiki back then. To me, our sound, the sound of black music comes from our experience in this country in combination with our connection to God and to our cultural practices that were here in America and the ones that we brought from Africa. That all of those things together, the sound that is emitted from that experience is black music. I would say, I gotta jump in. I would say that that comes through every single time. I mean, I. I I, I wonder if, uh, you know how they say, uh, they, they say, I don't know what the definition of porn is, but uh, you, you know it when you see it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm feeling that right now. I mean, I feel like I, uh, I hear it each time. And in each of these idioms, I swear, including in, uh, in, 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 in classical music by black composers, including them. I hear that soul, the, the spirit, the spiritual uh, history of who, who's doing it, I hear all of that uh, every time. I'm thinking now of, of, uh, of the, the, the Japanese, uh, those, 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 those ladies over there that I, that I started hearing a few years ago, before, be, before the, um, before the, the the white ladies were singing with all this soul, <laughs> like they are now on the on the R and B records, it was in Japan. And I was like, wow, they are copying. They were copying Aretha like crazy. Uh, the Japanese singers. I'm like, do they even know the meaning of the words? I wonder. You know, but I'm saying that to say, even though they, I mean, I talked about the right notes. I heard every note. And the riffs, the copying of the, you know, the little, the the, the, the small, the details of the, uh, of the riffs from Aretha, I'm, from Aretha. I'm hearing them copy them, brilliantly. But uh, that one, that one thing we're talking about that comes through every single time. I'm telling you, I hear it. I hear it in every, in, in, in all the rap. I mean, I, I can tell. I'm not trying to say that. <laughs> I almost am trying to say it. I should stop talking. I hear it every time. <laughs> you feel I'm me? <laughs> I'd like to answer that I'm question mad. as well. Um, <laughs> I think a concise definition uh, that encapsulates an answer to your question, what is Black music, is this. It is distinct expression birthed from oppression. Yeah. 
Now, is the I, I want all over the world the respect for what we're talking about, and I, and we're talking about each of these these idioms again. I I do find that we suddenly in the last few years have a lot closer to the proper respect for a lot of history, a lot of the music that was uh, really brushed on the rug and well, and not giving it. I mean, still look down, even the, as popular as it was, it was still looked down upon, upon you know, that uh, uh, to a degree until recently. Um, I, I, I'm just feeling like, I mean, Terry, you're talking about what, what's happening in the, in the school now. Don't you feel like that will, I mean, I can see the I can see where we are now as compared to 10 years ago, the, the growth of, well, how, how, we're, how we're treated is closer. The respect that the music is given in academia, in, 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 in the world. I mean, it was already Europe and Japan all over the world here last for some reason. And we, we're the ones that are <laughs> we're where it came from, but it got all the respect all over the world before here. We know that. But don't you feel like this is naturally moving in that direction. You guys are in position uh, in the schools. I'm not worried. I'm I'm suddenly not worried about Berkeley or Manhattan School of Music right now. Um, don't you feel like your presence? You, don't you feel like ten years from now that you'll be able to see what you've accomplished uh, in terms of everything that we're talking about? Yeah, I do personally. Um, I feel that. Uh, there's a consciousness happening now uh, that, you know, has has a, a new energy to it. Let me put it like that. Um, I feel that the I don't, I'm not sure if I would use the word respect. Um, I feel that it's respected on one hand, but um, as we've seen, you know, this through the Black Lives Matter movement and everything that's been happening, um, you know, there's this racial reckoning, uh, which involves you know everything right the music too so i think people are now coming to an understanding of how important you know the history is and the experience and it's not just something that you can uh you know put on paper and, and teach uh and how you know this kind of history has to be taught as well to all of the cultures and people that are trying to you know play black music um and you know the other thing i wanted to say is that to me, it's not linear. And we, we kind of get into these silos of these different genres, but all of the, uh, all of these genres or silos, they, they, they all grow branches like trees and it's just not linear. So like when we talk about learning history, it, it's, you have to do it in a way that, you know, you, you, you're not looking at it like what's well, first started. I mean, you have to, I think, learn the, you know, the blues, you know, jazz, you know, eventually you get to hip hop, but it's just not quite that simple. You know, yeah. and we've been talking about archiving and uh, all the stories when you get deep into archiving, you, you see how complicated it is. So I, I have, you know, co conflicts about that with people that want to look at it, you know, in this linear fashion, because mm -hmm. it's, that's forcing, well, I, I can't choose, you know, I can't choose who I am. I can't choose who I am as an artist and my influences. Um, like we've all kind of talked about all these various influences, I, just like I can't choose, you know, my identity between, you know, being black and being a woman. I have to look at that complicated history. And it's the same thing, oh, you know, I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, it's the same thing, you know, with, with the music. I mean, I spoke to a hip hop executive um, not too long ago, and uh, we served together on the board for uh, the Recording Academy. And uh, he was, they were starting a, a black music collective and um he said i said well i want to you know serve on this on this committee and there were no other jazz artists on the committee and i was like wow this this was really eye-opening to me and he said um oh i always thought of jazz as being more white and so you know these kinds of you know silos have created this you know this this thing where we don't know our history but we also don't know all the branches because so many jazz musicians um understand hip hop and understand, mm -hmm. you know, classical music or understand, you know, these other things and put it inside of their music. MG rock, you know, we claim rock, we claim, you know, it's just not a, a simple um, thing to, 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 uh, to fix, you know, this problem. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So we have our 
Jamie Bradford standing by with the next question. Jamie. Uh, thank you. And uh, my question basically is on uh, very close to Dwight's. I want to know, uh, like, there's jazz that you know immediately. Um, there's classical, as we were saying, so many other musics you know immediately. What is black music? You got bebop, you got the rap, you got the blues, you got so many identities. What is our identity? Uh, can we wrap that up in one sentence? Of, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm not going to have an answer for that, except that, that we can't wrap it up in a sentence. And maybe that, um, I mean, we're talking about a history, and I don't even want to. I don't want to also consider that oppression is where we start from. I refuse to consider that in my DNA structure. It doesn't start when I arrived on the shore of, of America, uh, my ancestors. So I refuse to accept that that's a part of how black music works. I think what we, what we, what we look for is the, is the narrative that expresses not only our being, but the beings before and the, and the beings to become. Um, and and that, is, that is sewn up in a rhythm and in a syncopation that always looks ahead. Um, rather than only looking back. Um, but yes, yeah, so I'll stop there. That ain't a sentence, but that's, that's a few. <laughs> okay. Everyone is like very unique, though, because you think away about the way there are Black people all over the world. And in different countries, Black people express their experience differently, even if they are experiencing oppression or, or different, some of the same circumstances. There is something unique about Black Americans and the way we do express and the way we, um, like our resilience. I think that's one of the dopest things about us that comes through in our music is our resilience, that we could be going through the hardest of times and we'll still make a banger about how dope we are and how excited we are and how, you know what I mean? I think our, like, and again, I think, I think Black, black Americans are the most God-believing people. <laughs> like, we love ourselves from God. Like, I just, I feel like that part of that is tied to intrinsically our connection to spirit. I really do. I think that is characteristic of our music is that it's so resilient and it's so raw and it's, um, like, we make something out of nothing all the time. And, we, and then we make other people envy it. <laughs> the nothingness that we made, we make other people envy it. So I would say, like, our resilience is is characteristic, you know, and our rhythm too. I think our rhythm is very unique here in the United States. Loving this conversation. Okay, we have one final question and this one is from George Shirley. Well, this is such an exciting panel and uh, there's so much going, rattling around in my head that I would like to express. Uh, I don't have it all the time to do that, but let me start off with a statement that Duke Ellington made. It's all music. I don't care how it comes out of the individual or out of the area in which that individual lives. It's all music. And it's made up of the same kinds of elements that are dictated by what is inside of the music maker. And what is inside of the music maker is given at conception. And it's that 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 creates the response to whatever that individual is experiencing, how that person will respond to that. Now, our ancestors came over here, not of their own accord, but they were brought in order to support the economy and brought under the most horrendous kinds of conditions in which they expressed their feelings through what were called sorrow songs. And those basic sorrow songs, three stanzas, became the basis of black music. In this country, we call black music. The, the pain, the expressions of hope gave birth to spirituals, the blues, jazz, all of those different genres of music that have come out of the black experience in this country. The fact is that the music of Europe, Europeans, is created from the, the same kinds of experiences, sometimes slavery, sometimes uh, uh, economic depression, pain and suffering, but because of what is in them that has been handed down from 
conception through their genes, it comes out somewhat differently. Uh, I listen to the music of, of uh, Jewish people, for instance. In Arabic, the rhythmic patterns, the melodic patterns, the way the music flows and goes, it's expressing the same feelings, human feelings, the feelings of the human animal, based on what has been implanted at conception that makes us, like young people say today, we are a them. We are part and parcel of every ancestor we've ever had. And how we respond is a result of what we've been given and what we've had to deal with and how we responded to it. It's all music. What is music? It's a language. It's a language. Babies put in the same room, born from different countries, make the same sounds that are arguably musical sounds. And the interesting thing is that the babies listen to each other and they understand on a primal level and they respond to each other. It's only after we grow up and become a, a more mature parts of our different ethnic communities that we no longer can understand each other. What happened to that basic language, that, that primal sound, that musical sound that babies make that could be understood at that point? So music, this thing we call music, is a language. It's a universal language. And one of the things that I've enjoyed doing what I was born to do is finding in the, the, the compositions of European composers like Schubert, Brahms, Strauss, Puccini, that element that exists in black music, if you will, that expresses truth, that expresses the truth. And it's all there. I can find in Puccini the same kinds of pain and suffering and joy that I can find in, a, in, in, in the music of black composers. In spirituals, I can find the same kind of pain in a, a, a song that is created by a European. It's all music. I would love to see at this point in, the, in American history, I'd love to have Congress start their sessions by singing, get on the same wavelength, during, when I've said before, when 9-11 when struck this country and I saw a congressperson standing on the steps singing patriotic songs, I wanted to go up to those who had voted against the National Endowment for the Arts and say, why are you singing right now? What does it mean for your spirit, for your soul? Why, why are you making these sounds, even though you're singing out of tune? <laughs> what does it mean to you to be standing here making these primal sounds that we call singing. And if you can come to an understanding of why you are moved to do this, then tell me why you feel that supporting, quote, the arts and music are not that important. So we're dealing with this thing called music that is a language. And as a singer, if I'm not standing, I don't care what I'm singing, whether it's a spiritual, whether it's a shooby dooby or whatever, if I'm not connected to my solar plexus mentally, where I feel things, where I feel emotion, and the sounds that I'm making are not expressing that to the audience, and I'm just making noise. When studying, I don't care what it is, something in English, if it's a spiritual, I've got to understand what those words mean. If it's an operatic aria, I've got to understand what those words mean if the sound that I make is going to have the effect on the audience that enables me to be communicating to their souls. I ask my students, you know, what is a solar plexus? Well, most of them don't know what that is. I say, well, it's a place where every nerve ending in your body comes together. It's in the center of your body. Some people call it a chakra. It's where you feel things. And there is a nerve that comes out of that gathering that's called the vagus nerve, not Las Vegas, but the vagus nerve. 
It wraps around your heart and is connected to your larynx. Oh. And when I sing and when I teach my students, try to teach them what it is to express the message of whatever the song is they're singing, whether it's in English, whether it's in whatever. I said, unless you are in touch with that pathway between your mind, your heart, and your throat, then you're just going to be making noise. So when we say- George, George, sorry to interrupt. We're out of time. We need to ask your question. Well, okay. The question, I would say a, a statement. Understand that music, yes, is, is international. It belongs to everyone. Like Duke Ellington said, it's all music. And all of it should express and emotion to carry a message. Otherwise, it's just meaningless noise. And this can be, that message should also come through the drum, through the horn, what have you. If you're not saying something, you're making noise. Mr. Shirley, it's always good to hear your voice yes, explain was, music yes. to us. <laughs> that was highly valuable, yes. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you all for joining us. What an amazing panel. We hope that everyone will reflect on today's presentation as a call to action, underscoring the importance of preserving our rich musical history. Thank you. Thank you for joining us for today's panel. We hope you'll reflect on today's presentation as a call to action, underscoring the importance of preserving our rich musical history. Thank you. Thank you.